If you're like us, you've probably seen references to something called Munchausen's by proxy and been curious without really understanding what it is or how it may affect people. That's why we were excited to hear about the new podcast, Nobody Should Believe Me. The host, novelist Andrea Dunlop, takes an in-depth look at this subject. No one has ever done this before. She talks with people who have been affected by this condition. She even speaks with a perpetrator. We've already listened to the first two episodes, and we can tell you that Andrea doesn't dwell on the darkness. She takes great pains not to be gory or exploitative. This show has heart. It focuses on the humanity of everyone involved. And what makes this podcast extra special is that Andrea has a deeply personal connection to this subject. Someone very close to her was investigated for Munchausen by proxy. That gives the show a real emotional punch. When Andrea is listening to people tell stories about how they've been affected by this condition, she is not some uninvolved outsider. She has lived through the very same pain they have. She understands them. And through this podcast, she helps all of us understand them too. New episodes drop every Thursday. Listen and subscribe to Nobody Should Believe Me on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Content warning, this episode contains discussion of the murder of two young girls, child sexual abuse materials, as well as disturbing sexual content. So this week on the murder sheet, there's been a lot of stuff happening, a lot of media coverage around recent developments in the case, namely the water search going on in Peru, Indiana, uh, that we reported on last week, as well as some of the court filings indicating that Kick and Klein is in negotiations of some sort and has been transferred into Indiana State Police custody for a limited time. Um, so all that is to say, today we're just kind of jumping in with some analysis to sort of talk about some recent things. As you can tell, we're speaking without a script today. Uh, because we don't really have time to write one, and we kind of just want to get you what we know as soon as possible. Uh, we know a lot of people are following this case very closely. We'll be sharing our analysis, and we'll also be sharing a few new pieces of information along the way. Exactly. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders, a 1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. Now we're looking to track restaurant homicides. To help us understand the patterns of these crimes, we created a spreadsheet of nearly a thousand eatery-related killings, the murder sheet. We'll be drawing on that data throughout season one to give you a deep dive into undercovered crimes. We're the murder sheet. And this is the Delphi Murders. Talking with Kagan Klein. One thing that a lot of people don't know or fully appreciate is that while Kagan Klein has been in jail, he has not been isolated. Of course, people on his visitation list have options to visit him in different ways, but that is not the only way Kagan Klein has been able to communicate with the outside world. He has traditionally had some sort of what they call a chirping device, which means he can communicate within the walls of his jail with the outside world. Uh, basically how this works is you, the person who wants to speak with an inmate puts down some money and sends a text to their device. And you can get so many texts for like $15, say. It's pretty simple. It's pretty expensive. 
Yes, but it is uh, certainly a device that Kagan Klein has made full use of during his incarceration. And since we've started covering this case, we have heard from numerous people who have been in contact with Kagan Klein, not only through letter, but through this so-called chirping device. And some of the things they've told us about the communication with him has been very interesting. We actually have been able to trade a few texts with Kagan Klein as well, although for reasons that will soon become clear, uh, (laughs) we didn't get that far. Why don't we just cut to the chase and start sharing uh, our text exchange with Kagan Klein? We will do this the same way we did our transcripts when we read from the transcripts. When we start reading from the text, you will hear this sound. And you will also hear that sound when we stop reading from the text. And just as we did when we were reading from the transcript of the Kagan Klein interrogation, Anya will play the part of the questioner, and I will play the part of Kagan Klein. And to be clear, that these texts run from August 25th to August 30th. Hello, Kagan. Hope this message finds you well. My name is Anya. My partner Kevin and I reached out to you before. Would love to check in and see how you're doing. Don't message me again. You have put out so much bullshit against me. I get you have a podcast and want money from this, but it's wrong what you're doing, Anya. What exactly did we report on that is misinformation? If you say we got information wrong, we will take that seriously. There is a lot of misinformation. People doing interviews that don't even know me, Anya, and lying all about me. I'm very upset about it. I'm having a hard enough time. I understand why that would be frustrating. I would be interested in getting your story directly from you so people could get a good idea of how things look from your perspective. Can I ask you some questions? We won't press you if there are certain things you don't want to talk about. I was advised by my lawyer to not answer any questions from anyone. I apologize for that. I'm very biased when it comes to your podcast due to the past. Can I ask, is my chirp number out there in public? Or how did you get it? First of all, our allusion to previous conversation with Kagan took the form of some uh, a letter we sent him way back when we first started reporting on this. And I believe we actually read that letter on an earlier episode, did we not? Yeah, we did. We d- and just just reminding everybody, uh, we heard back from him once. It was kind of a very polite response. Didn't hear back from him again. From what he's saying, sounds like he was not that happy with some of the reporting we've done subsequently. Yes. And of course, it is just common journalistic practice when you're covering someone, you occasionally try to contact them to get their perspective. That's what we were doing here with Kagan Klein. From this early part of the exchange, I think it's really striking how much self-pity he has. He's the one that catfished and manipulated all of these young girls. He's the one that collected truly horrific pieces of child sexual abuse materials on his devices. That's what he's charged with. Yes. But somehow he is the victim. He's the one that's having a hard time. Poor Kagan. Well, I also note that he, you know, I mean, obviously, right, we we all know from following this case that sometimes media outlets get it wrong. Sometimes Really good reporters get things slightly wrong. So I'm not, we certainly don't see ourselves as perfect or beyond making a mistake. And so if there is something we made a mistake on, we would love to clear it up. That's why we asked him. That's very sincere. That's not just us saying that. And so I would think if there was something truly wrong or incorrect out there about him, he would have taken that opportunity to share it with us. Yes, And if he did have a specific complaint about inaccuracies, uh, we certainly would have shared his perspective with our audience. He did not seem to have a specific complaint. As to how we got his chirp number, I'll be a little discreet, but I'll say it wasn't that difficult. (laughs) No. No, it was not. I'm just curious to hear about what it is about the podcast that has upset you. If you feel we have put incorrect information out there, can you please let us know what that incorrect information is? I am sure you understand it is hard for me to answer your questions when you won't answer any of mine. How many questions are you wanting to ask? I'll answer some, 
but not for free. Everyone is making money off my name, and I'm sitting in here hungry with nothing. Just saw your interview on the news when they were talking about me. So it's interesting that he mentions being hungry. We've gotten reports from people Mm -hmm. who have seen Kagan in recent times, and they have indicated that contrary to being hungry, Kagan has actually gained a substantial amount of weight while he's been incarcerated. Which I would say is pretty rare because I think in many cases, and this is a, this is a social problem. So I mean, I'm not I'm not saying this flippantly, but the quality of food when you're incarcerated is often notoriously bad, and it's common for people to drop weight while being incarcerated because they don't want to eat the food, and you know that's not good, obviously. But when you are when you are uh, getting money say or you're well off you can purchase things from a jail commissary yes and we'll get to this a bit later but the fact that he's gained weight uh goes to the fact that some people out there are sending kagan money and he's using uh a certain amount of that money to purchase snack items at the commissary and he's really packing on the pounds according to what we've heard yeah and we don't we don't say that to be critical of anybody's body size or his body size, just as a factual clue towards looking at possibly the fact that he is money might be pouring in for him. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later because it's going to be very relevant to our conversation with him. Yes, I have been on TV to talk about Delphi. I cover the story closely and you are part of the story. I understand it is frustrating to have other people talk about you. That is why I am reaching out and offering to share your perspective. Is that something you would be interested in? Yes, off the record. If I'm paid, I will do that. I'm not doing anything anymore without being paid. I'm done being used and not getting anything out of it. Let me know what Kevin thinks about everything. I'll give you however long of an interview you want or need. We can do it by visit or phone calls. Up to you. Of course, reporters don't pay sources. But both Kevin and I feel it is important to get your perspective on things, especially since you feel no one is giving you that chance. Can we arrange an in-person visit? I'm not doing a visit without being paid first. Barbara McDonald already tricked me into an interview for $500, and I never seen a dime of it. Uh, okay, so... <laughs> well, first of all, let's yeah. stress, I think anyone who's followed this case, certainly anyone who's read the interrogation transcript is fully aware that Kagan Klein does not have an undying loyalty to the truth. In other words, he tends to lie and dissemble a lot, especially if he believes that lying will help him get what he wants. In this case, he wants us to give him money, and he believes telling us this story about Barbara McDonald would help him achieve that aim. It's difficult for us to believe that Barbara McDonald made a promise like that to Kagan Klein. I will say we reached out to Barbara McDonald and CNN, headline news. We got a reply back that did not specifically deny that they offered Kagan money, but did say that generally speaking, HLN has a very firm policy against paying sources. Yeah, I have a hard time believing that she would do that, that HLN would do that. That's kind of a pretty firm line in the sand in my experience as a journalist that you do not pay sources at all. I mean, that's it. I like, like no no debate really. Uh, you you would get in trouble for that. And and frankly, in the in a very high profile investigation, you could be seen as tainting the source by paying for it. Yeah, if someone's going to be a witness in a criminal trial or even a criminal investigation and that person has been paid to tell a specific story, then obviously people involved in the investigation begin to think, well, maybe this person is just telling that story because he was paid. I also find it somewhat uh, darkly humorous that a person accused of possession of child sexual abuse materials is concerned with other people profiting off his name 
as if his name is associated with something good and productive that other people are just latching onto rather than reporting on a very real and very serious crime that he's accused of. So again, we're seeing the kind of victimization thing. It's interesting. He's full of self-pity. We're really getting a lot of sense into his personality and sort of what his concerns are here. Uh, Typically, I think it's absolutely fair to have criticisms of the media. There's discussions about that that can be had, but coming from him, it's kind of like, uh, yeah. The money focus is really interesting to me. Like, that's the thing he's so hung up on at the end of the day. Yeah. Not clearing his name, not pushing back against any narratives that he claims smeared him, growing his bank account in in jail. But anyways, when we texted back, we sort of wanted to play along a bit and get a sense of whether that could be true, because if that was true, that's wild. So, wow, she promised you money and didn't pay it. Can you tell us what happened and how that interview was set up? I want $300 put on my commissary and $100 on my chirp. That's my demand, Anya. Other than that, I'm not going to reply. Hope you understand. Have a good day. Let me know when you and Kevin talk. I'll do an hour interview if needed. Have a good day, Anya. Uh, I want to make clear that those that last bit I read was actually two messages there's a little bit of time between them. I think it's interesting how he goes from playing hardball to trying to become the nice guy saying, oh, have a good day. I don't think he really wants to talk to us. I think he really wants money. I think that's what I'm seeing there because, it. it I mean, right? I mean, he's, he's really seems he's switching tactics. He's trying to see if he can manipulate us into doing this. Um, I find that very interesting. I mean, we asked about also the HLN interview because I've always been very curious about how the heck that happened even in in December of 2021. We've reported on that. So we were just curious if we could get any tidbits, but we didn't, obviously. But it's it's really interesting seeing the kind of switching back and forth. The nice guy, the tough guy, he's just trying any tax to get what he wants Several times during this exchange, he told us that he didn't want to hear from us anymore. And then he always wrote back. Yeah, we listen. I mean, he doesn't we don't want to sound like we think you absolutely have to speak to us. You don't. You can you, you pick and choose whatever media outlet you want to speak to. Maybe that's us. Maybe that's HLN. Maybe that's somebody else. Uh, but, you know, I felt like he kept on coming back to us in a way that I found surprising. After we pretty much set a pretty firm boundary. So I think most people are kind of like, okay, that's your policy. Bye. It's also kind of interesting. You told him you didn't want to. First of all, let's make clear that even though he was acting like all the messages came from you alone, we both wrote all those messages together. Yeah. And I guess maybe my first, maybe the first message me saying, hey, I'm Anya. And then, you know, Kevin's here, too. Maybe that was confusing and he was just picking up on that. But I noticed that, too. He immediately singled out on me. And then also he seemed to think, well, Anya is saying she's not going to pay me, but I bet Kevin will. Kevin's going to intervene on my behalf. So talk to Kevin. See what (laughs) Kevin will come in. and Kevin's uh, going to be nodding and looking at our bank account. I mean, not to be silly, but like, what? And like, I mean, again, just don't don't pay for interviews, guys, just in general, people in general. You know, if you if you're if you're kind of if you're a podcaster or a YouTuber or whatever, and you don't have a media background, that's fine. You're not you know, there's there's no barrier to entry. Do your thing. I'm not trying to gatekeep here, but don't do that. Maybe maybe like look at a journalism 101 textbook before you do anything, because that's just not I I think that's not okay. And I think that muddies the waters for everybody, frankly. Agreed. You know, it's one thing if you're a documentary crew and you're like, you know, flying somebody in and you're, you know, paying for their hotel. That's one thing. But that's not what he's asking for here. He's asking for payment for an interview. Specifically on his commissary tab. (laughs) Jesus. I spoke with Kevin and we would definitely be interested in doing an hour interview with you. How can we arrange that? I will not talk until payment is made. I hope you understand. I've been duped in the past. The website is inmatesales.com for the visits. Let me know. As we said, we don't pay sources. 
You say you've been unfairly criticized and people don't know your perspective. We are offering you a chance to share your side. It seems to us that would be valuable to you. If you think it is more valuable to hold out for a few hundred dollars worth of cigarettes, that is your choice. No journalist that people will trust is ever going to pay you. Okay, your loss. TMZ already offered to pay something, so you're completely wrong about that. Sorry to burst your bubble, but you're a podcaster, not a journalist, Anya. Hashtag Marlboro Menthols. And I should say, after the hashtag Marlboro Menthols, there's also an emoji of a happy face. There you go. I think our our reply back was a little bit spicier than we're normally communicating with people. But I did want to emphasize to him that, like, if you feel, like, wronged by us or other media who are not, perhaps you know, perhaps there's things you want to share, then having an audience, you know, there's value in that. And frankly, we didn't know the extent of him asking for money from other people at this point. But uh, so I was we were a bit we were frustrated, but more of just like baffled by this because it was like if if I were in a situation where I'm incarcerated and, you know, people th- there's a narrative out there about me, you know, the narrative being police documents discussing my crimes, essentially. I mean, we're not just c- getting out there and picking on him because we know him or you know, don't like him or something. We're just reporting on what's out there. Uh, seems kind of bizarre to put a line in the sand for some sort of pain. Yeah, if I see somebody on television saying things about me and my case that I feel aren't true, and then that person reaches out and wants to hear my side, and if I feel I have something to say, I'll say it to that person. And I think what was really frustrating to us, we felt we were just being sort of jerked around. Yes, we were. If you don't want to talk to us, that's fine. We're not going to put the pressure on. We're going to ask, and you say no, that's fine. But he kept on coming back, and that was uh, annoying. Yeah, we. I guess we kept on saying, well, we'll talk to you. We'll talk to you. Because I, I think we we didn't know if this was some sort of, like, test, perhaps. Like, the money, you know, like, maybe maybe the money thing is something he throws out there to see if, see if we'll cave or not. <laughs> and then if we don't, then maybe, you know, you move forward. If we do, then he gets some money out of it as well. So I think we were curious to see how sincere that was or if that was part of some sort of game. So we kept on pushing to a certain degree, but at at the end of the day, we're not going to pay anybody. And that's, that's it. So before we get back to it, after that hashtag marble menthols text from Kagan, we didn't reply to that. Nope. But we did get a message saying Kagan Klein wants to text with you or wants to send a message or yes. something. Yes. And at that point we I guess we'd run out of chirp text. And again, these are very expensive, you know. They it's it sort of seems like a very unfair system because it makes people who are financially disadvantaged uh have to suffer more than people with who are prisoners with wealthier family members. So we yes. both we both had an issue with that system. So Kagan Klein wants to text with you again. So we put another $15 down on the chirping account so we could have a few more texts with Kagan Klein. We just figured maybe he's changed his mind or thought it over or, you know, he has some maybe invective he wants to hurl at us. We don't know. But we want to hear him out. We got a message last night that you wanted to text us. No, I have nothing to say to either of you. Goodbye. So that was a message Kagan Klein sent us on Saturday. A couple of days went by, and then he reached out to us again. Think how big and how many views an hour-long podcast with me would get you, and all it would cost you was $400, Anya. I know you say you don't pay sources, but that's a lie. LOL. I'm doing an interview tonight at 8 So you have until then to consider it. You want the first interview, Anya. You know after that you regret not doing it. Kagan, you said there were things out there about you that were not true. As a courtesy to you, we offered you the opportunity to share your perspective with our audience. That offer is still out there. We are not going to pay you, Kagan, and we are not going to change our minds on that. Okay, no problem. Have a good day. And that's it. So, yeah, it, it, he was definitely hustling till the end to try to set this up, which is interesting. 
I guess his perception of of people who are covering this case is everybody's just in it for for <laughs> downloads and clicks, which I think you and I have criticized or you know spoken privately about you know sometimes when we feel people are doing that, but you're you're not. I mean, I don't know. I, we're we're not gonna throw away our any shred of integrity to get an interview with somebody who is kind of hard to believe on a good day. And let's be clear, Kagan Klein is not exactly a skilled or reliable media critic. No, no, I would not say so. I would not say so. But it, 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 his perception of everybody else being in, in it for something else is, is interesting. Uh, and in fact, since we've had this exchange with him, we've learned that he's had similar exchanges with other people. He's chirped other podcast hosts, people who are on YouTube, offering to give them all sorts of valuable information in exchange for money. He's basically trying to trick people into giving him money because money is something that's terribly important to him. Yes. As important as money is to Kagan, there is something else that is also extraordinarily, disturbingly important to Kagan Klein, and that is his own sexual gratification. Uh, we, As we indicated, we've heard from a number of people who have had communications with Kagan Klein via chirp and via letter since he's been incarcerated. A number of those people are women, and many of those communications that Kagan Klein has had with them have quickly turned sexual. We're not going to go into the details, but they involve Kagan trying to manipulate these women into doing sexual favors for him in exchange for him providing information. Some of these sexual acts that he wants are kind of disturbing and upsetting. And one thing that makes it especially disturbing and upsetting to me is the crimes that Kagan Klein is charged with involve him manipulating and tricking young women into providing sexual gratification for him. And he is incarcerated while awaiting trial for those crimes. And during his incarceration, he is still manipulating and tricking women into providing sexual gratification for him. Of course, in this case, the women who are doing this are women. They're adults. They're not children. But still, it is very disturbing to me personally that this heinous behavior that he is charged with is still to some extent continuing even though he is incarcerated. He is still behaving abominably to women. Yeah, it's it's really disturbing. It's really disturbing. I think, you know, here we see that it's just uh, maybe the demographic he's accused of preying on has, has changed, but uh, the behavior really is pretty similar. And that's really grim. This is a really this is a really grim case, guys, and just an upsetting situation all around. And and for for things to continuously just turn into just this guy's gratification of his own sexual desires, that is that is such a central thing in his life, seemingly to the point of to the point of any sort of. Uh, <laughs> yes, if, if if you chirp or try to communicate with Keg and Klein. Please remember, he's not interested in being your friend. He's not interested in giving you information. He's interested in using you and exploiting you. Maybe it's kind of funny a little bit that he tried to get money from us and failed. But he's trying to get money from other people. Maybe he's failing there. Maybe he's succeeding. I don't know. He's also trying to get women to perform sexual acts for him. All he cares about seemingly is exploiting other people and getting other people to serve his needs. Actually, why don't we go ahead and give some specific examples of what we've been talking about? In other words, why don't we read some of the sexually explicit texts that Kagan has been exchanging with people 
so that you all get at least a general idea of what we are talking about. And just to be clear, these are pretty graphic and gross. And so if you want to skip ahead five minutes or so, now's the time to do that. Can I jack off for you on FaceTime if you're ever alone? You can trust me, even though you're modest, no one would know. I think this is really an interesting excerpt because it shows us that Kagan is back to his old habits. Uh, We want to be clear that the people he's speaking with nowadays are adults. So obviously, you know, nobody's underage here, but you're seeing him utilizing online materials, online methods to continue to sate his sexual desire. And it's, it's kind of disturbing in the sense that that's what he's in jail for and he's still up to it. He's still doing the same things. Uh, so it is, it is disturbing, and I imagine he'll have a lot less opportunity to do things such as this once he is in prison. Why would a jail be more, I mean, can you speak to that as, a, as an officer of the court yourself? It, 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 what would be the difference between him being in jail right now and him being in prison? Because that might not be apparent to, to lay people. A person goes to prison after they have been convicted of a crime. A person is in jail when they're awaiting a trial for a crime. So it makes sense that a person who is innocent until proven guilty would have more rights and privileges than a person who has already been found guilty. That makes a lot of sense. Would you go to church when you get out? I know God can do incredible things in our lives when we trust him and have faith. I do think you'd be rewarded by what you're doing to help Abby and Libby's families get some closure and justice. Thank you so much for that. IDK if I'd go to church, TBH. And would you be okay with my cum and your pussy? You're welcome. I love you. Uh, The the switching from discussion of church and (laughs) forgiveness and... And the Abby, murder of two young girls that he's associated with to sexual desire is shocking. It's amazingly inappropriate. I think it gives us a real glimpse into who the real Kagan Klein is. He likes to hide and present more glamorized images of himself. As if he's someone special or clever or funny or a master manipulator. But at the end of the day... He's someone, if you're talking about God, if you're talking about finding justice for two murdered young girls, he will still turn the conversation around to his own sexual desires. That is who Kagan Klein is. What is our communications, our understanding of other people's communications with Kagan and and just all this all this recent news to come out? What does that indicate to you about Kagan Klein and sort of what's going on? I think Kagan has an inflated view of himself. I think he doesn't realize what he really faces in the future. What about you? I I have felt from the beginning of our reporting on him, from talking with people who knew him, uh, who know him, from looking at some of the claims he made on social media, I've always felt that this is a person who on some level is operating in some sort of fantasy land. And we see fantasy come up again and again in his life. He's moving out to Vegas. He's a bail bondsman. He's a park ranger. I mean, you know, he's a rapper. And, you know, the reality doesn't seem to matter to him so much as the perception. And I would say that with... With this latest instance, he's taking his fantasies into jail, quite literally. He's he's still looking for sexual favors. He's still trying to be a high roller. He's still trying to make money off of this. Um, and that's just really interesting because I think it gets to something about him that I've always kind of sensed about. You know, he, he really is kind of in a dreamland. <laughs> and I think... If you can maintain that fantasy, even in prison, even in jail, that's that's very interesting. And to me, it indicates that 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 allure, that fantasy really does have a hold on him. And that's where he kind of lives. And uh, I will be very curious to see 
what happens with him as he sort of is confronted with possible deals, possible the possibility of a trial in 2023, and, and what sort of decisions he makes based on those very real, probably very scary possible outcomes for himself and, and, and what happens because, you know, it just seems like his go-to is to just kind of fall back onto the, let me manipulate people for sexual favors. Let me, uh, let me make out so that I'm, you know, got a lot of money and I'm the guy with the wealthiest guy at the commissary or what, you know, (laughs) like I have the most money in jail. It's just kind of interesting that those seem to be almost his like coping mechanisms. And, uh, I, I just wonder how long that can really work for anybody, even somebody with so strong a, a kind of a grip on this fantasy. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at M Sheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to the Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>